Hi there. Welcome to another online event from the University of Toronto's Centre for Ethics. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Mariana Valverde from the University of Toronto Centre for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies, Professor Alexandra Flynn from the University of British Columbia's Peter A. Allard School of Law. They'll be discussing their fascinating, recently released edited volume entitled Smart Cities in Canada, Digital Dreams, Corporate Designs, with a panel of distinguished commentators. After the introduction to the volume from Professors Valverde and Flynn, we're gonna hear from Professor Beth Coleman from the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information and Technology and the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, Professor Renee Sieber from the Department of Geography at McGill University, and Professor David Murakami Wood, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Surveillance Studies at the Department of Sociology at Queen's University. Before we move into today's discussion of development in Canadian cities, maligned or otherwise, it's essential to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And with that, I'll pass the virtual floor over to Professors Flynn and Valverde. Okay, so um, we're going to do a very brief introduction because we're mostly interested in hearing the comments from the wonderful commentators that Marcus Duber has organized. So um, I'll say something about how the book came to be. Um, and incidentally, it's published by Lorimer, a small press here in Toronto, definitely a uh, I was going to say a startup, but I guess people don't think of book publishers as startups, but it's definitely the kind of thing that uh, many of us want to support. And they have made sure that the book is very reasonably priced, uh, especially the ebook version. So just encouraging people to order it via the Lorimer website. Um, don't use that big international service that starts with a capital A <laughs> to order the book. Um, okay, so how did the book um, you know, come about? Well, I had been uh, talking with Alex Flynn, who was then a professor of urban studies at U of T, about our common interest in urban law and urban governance. I had also been doing quite a bit of research on public-private infrastructure partnerships. Uh, in Ontario. So I actually knew what an Infrastructure Ontario contract looked like. I'm probably the only person in Canada, apart from the lawyers who dropped the contracts, who know what that looks like. So when I heard about Waterfront Toronto um, having this agreement with Sidewalk Labs, I thought, well, my gosh, this is going to be the public-private partnership, you know, to end all public-private partnerships. Um, so I got interested in that. And so Alex and I started to go to the initial supposedly consultation meetings, but they were really just sort of PR exercises. Um, and we started doing research on it. We were particularly interested in the public partner side of it. Like what is Waterfront Toronto and why was it doing this and how could it do it? Because smart city projects around the world almost always involve an actual municipality, the municipal corporation. So the fact that the city of Toronto wasn't the one that was doing the partnership was odd to be, to uh, you know, say the least. So we started working on that. And then along the way, we met various people who had a lot more expertise than we did on questions of data, surveillance, privacy, and so on. So we met people like Andrew Clement, who contributed to the book, uh, David Murakami Wood, um, uh, you know, Natasha Tusikov from York and other people who had had more of a history in the data and surveillance and data governance kinds of issues. Um, so it was very productive, you know, I think for us who came from urban law and governance to see something about and learn something about big data and surveillance and so on. And so we wanted to, um, eventually we decided it would be good to have a volume that would put together our urban law and governance research together with the expertise of people who came from other um, areas, especially data governance. 
And we didn't want the book to just be about the Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto. We definitely wanted to include other perspectives. Now, this wasn't easy because we didn't have a grant or anything like that. We didn't have money to go around asking people to do new research. And we weren't necessarily that well connected at the beginning. Um, so we wanted to have Guelph and we wanted to have Montreal represented, but we were relying on our own imperfect contacts. Anyway, we at least put together some information about smart city projects outside of Toronto. And so we're hoping that in the future, other people will do more research, more in-depth studies, maybe some ethnographies of smart city projects, many of which were sort of stopped during COVID anyway. So afterwards, it'll be good to see what's happening. Uh, and we're really interested in facilitating a conversation and a debate because we're not, you know, the experts who have the recipe. We are just interested in sort of catalyzing discussions about these things. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to discuss it with knowledgeable people like Beth and Renee and David. So Alex, do you have? Sure, I'll make a few comments. So first of all, thank you everybody for being here today and especially to our wonderful commentators. I, I'm eager and excited to hear what they have to say. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge that I'm coming to you from, uh, from Vancouver, which you see in the background, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Coast Salish peoples. Um, so this project was so fun. Um, I mean, it's always fun to work with Mariana um, but this project in particular was a real exploration. I mean, as academics, we, you know, we often have to write in a particular way, or especially me as a pre-tenure person, or um, kind of present our material in certain kinds of conferences and, and that kind of thing. But this was just fun. It was a fun project. Mariana and I, um, you know, started from just a keen interest in what was happening on the waterfront in Toronto? What were these heated sidewalks that were proposed? What was the tall timber that was being suggested? And from there, we very quickly realized that this was not just a story about, you know, development on the waterfront or about sidewalk labs coming to Canada. This was a much larger project about um, equity, about fairness, about, you know, who, who makes decisions that are going to affect urban space. And that was the lens that we, that we brought to this project uh, from the get-go. Privacy was obviously in, you know, the, the umbrella that, uh, that this uh, project, the sidewalk project, was framed within. But for us, it was a much larger question about governance. And so when it came time to think beyond sidewalk to smart cities more generally, we realized that we could not tell this story without talking about communities across the country that are not going to be getting uh, heated sidewalks, that are not going to be you know, every day in the news um, because it's such a sexy and exciting project. And so that's where we, we pivoted. We, we, we wanted to frame this subject within a larger question of who is technology for? Who are the people who are included digitally? So I just wanna talk very briefly because I think it's so urgent and important um, about remote and Northern areas in Canada and the extent to which uh, smart cities are also a question of infrastructure. So infrastructure like you know, buses and telephone lines, digital infrastructure is just as important. And of course, during the pandemic, we see the urgency for this as people are you know, needing technology to go to school, to go to university, to access healthcare, you know, all of the same things that those of us in cities depend on with our internet connections, so too do people in rural and Northern areas. And so one of the places that we focus in particular is on Nunavut, in Echaluit, Nunavut, which is the largest city in Nunavut, uh, you know, 8,000 people, um, but also about all of the communities that are part of the Nunavut area. Um, and the extent to which this is a real um, example of where digital exclusion uh, is happening. So, um, you know, recently the Globe and Mail uh, published a, a newspaper article 
on the extent to which people in Nunavut are facing record high internet fees and the problems that have plagued that area for a long time in terms of dependence on satellite versus um, fiber optic cable um, are only continuing. And uh, that's the other dimension to this book that's really important to note is that there is privacy, there are surveillance issues, um, smart cities tap into you know, questions of public private partnerships and you know, who are cities making decisions with, but they also talk uh, about and animate a very simple situation, which is equity and fairness in our, in our cities, in our communities. Um, and that's a dimension of the book that is really key for us. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you much for providing us with uh, some great context to get a, a great conversation going. Uh, our first uh, commentator is Dr. Coleman, and so I'll pass it off to, to them. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, so Mariana and Alexandra, I just want to start with thank you. This book is super timely, and even though it's um, a modest size, um, the speed and also the kind of diversity of things that you're able to cover, including a, a thick middle around sidewalk labs is, is quite welcome. So thank you again. Um, I like the, um, uh, the subtitle of the introduction, Civic Leaders Survivors Game. I'm just like, yes, it has been like the Hunger Games of smart cities. And we're trying to look to see who's still standing here, you know, who's got the bow and arrow. Um, what I would like to focus on in my comments is uh, perhaps not surprisingly, um, sidewalk labs, and I'm specifically going to key my, my thoughts to some of Andrew Clement's um, uh, contribution because of a couple reasons. Because Andrew and I had worked together on some of the data trust imaginings at Mars when they were organizing those workshops. And I also um, had a background in working with sidewalk labs in New York City when they were organizing things around designing the Link NYC kiosks. Um, and some of those details, I don't think I can share, but others I, I, I think I am, am able to talk about in relationship to, in addition to part of the public private here is um, also the framework of the historical inheritance of how things get paid for. And the idea, um, in the New York City case is public telephones, and they were telephones, were paid for by advertisement on the side of those boxes. So they imported or they moved forward that same model with the Link NYC Wi-Fi kiosks. And it's been, a, I don't know, a relatively catastrophic effect in terms of just porting forward uh, a, a, an inherited model. So. The, the two primary things that, I mean, Andrew's talking about participation and what actually merits true participation in a process, in a process around a city and uh, essentially public space is what we're framing here. The other part that I'd like to um, just touch on is digital infrastructure. And Alexandra's already talked about that quite well. So that's outside of the climate article, but this is, this is mission critical in terms of how we are moving forward with the lessons learned over the past couple of years. And um, I hope somebody's going to talk some more about the Montreal uh, Smart City Project as well, because I would I'd like to hear more about it. So, in terms of participation, um, <laughs> this basic idea that if you've already framed the project and then you ask uh, a city or a community for input, that's not participation. That's, I don't know, at best presentation. And the challenge here in terms of building the, um, I can't say resilience because uh, Mariana has already kind of skewered resilience as one of the many trending words that we've moved through in terms of talking about cities, but how to sustain and support and make um, uh, valuable in the sense of uh, people's inputs, they're not identical, but that they are valued in a process 
So again, um, how power works in these relationships. And part of the work that I've been doing with uh, international collaborators on this is really trying to model and create uh, best practices. And you know, obviously I'm not alone in this, in how we have um, participants who come in from the inception of a essentially digital infrastructure project and continue to participate throughout. So they're part of all of those processes. And one of the things that was so um, essentially maddening about the Sidewalk Lab process, which you guys point out in the book is there was all this perfect language. There was all this gesturing around participation without any real way to account for, well, what do they actually mean when they say, we're not going to be whole collecting your data. I, you know, I, I had met with the CTO, uh, Amis, when they first arrived and he said, well, we're not collecting your data. I said, well, that's great. We don't have a problem then. But what that actually meant to have our data pass through their system was, was never sufficiently answered. And in my view, and I think that's supported in, in the pieces in the book, there's a way in which it was a failure of trust in the end. So that brings me to the second topic and Jamie let me know what my timing is here. Digital infrastructure is um, super complicated in terms of the capacity of IoT instruments in relationship to uh, AI systems and other advanced automation. The ability to, or even something old and familiar like Bluetooth and Bluetooth sniffing, um, the capacity to extract information where the, the entities that know that this, is, this uh, call is happening, your phone, the lamppost, but not you is, is profound and it's not theoretical. We are already surrounded by these installations and for policy to be the first line of protection around that, for the, the, the rules around where surveillance is allowed in a city is obviously not sufficient. We are, we're not even meeting that threshold with CCTV cameras, let alone uh, IoT arrays. So one of the things that I've been looking at in a white paper that I'm finishing now is King Street pilot, which is, it's not the, a pilot anymore, it's been ratified, but it's become the template for the city of Toronto's um, digital policy framework. And what you have is the, the busiest thoroughfare in the city of Toronto, where, um, and you guys all recognize this language, the efficiency around getting the streetcar down the street faster is one goal, but then also placemaking is another goal and then economic growth, you know, the restaurants and vendors get more business because there are more people walking on the street because it's a more walkable city, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things are very familiar in terms of city um, design. <laughs> Some of it's the legacy from the creative city, but what does placemaking mean and what does innovation mean in this context? And one of the things that um, I am looking at comparatively is with the Sidewalk Labs model, we have people's uh, attention, this idea of money, and this idea of um, a private company, a private US company coming in to do this work and the level of activism to push back against it was clear and profound, even if it was a small number of people, it made a lot of noise and a lot of impact but we don't have that kind of um, energized engagement around something like the King Street pilot because it's a municipal project. And in effect, the technology that we're living with on King Street is already enacting all of these things around non-permissional information uptake. And that's one silo around it, but in addition to privacy and individual privacy, uh, there are also um, questions about what happens to our um, both 
policy framework and civic imagination around public space. So that's those, those are my comments. I I hope I was within the time frame. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And yes, well within uh, our allotted time frame. Uh, uh, so, so making the connection to, to Montreal that you that you sort of called out earlier in in, in your, your remarks, I'd love to pass it over to Professor Renee Sieber, who I believe is coming at us from Montreal. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land that's long served as a site of meeting exchange among many, many Indigenous people without which we wouldn't have a Montreal, including the Haudenosaunee tribes and the Anishinaabe uh, nations. Uh, we honor, recognize, and respect these nations as traditional stewards, continuing traditional stewards of the lands and waters in which we meet today. So I'd like to bring up uh, three points, uh, maybe not too much about Montreal, but just points in general about this fabulous book. Um, so I'll try not to be uh, too critical and drag on anybody. Uh, so one, point one, is Canada or are Canadian cities more susceptible to the hype PR and aesthetic of tech and smart cities than other places? And I think that was, this was excellently brought out in the book, uh, TLDR, yes. So the question is why? Uh, are we more susceptible to the pump and dump kind of nature of uh, sidewalk labs and, and other kinds of initiatives like AI in Montreal and in other places in Canada? <clears throat> One is, as was pointed out in the book, cities in Canada are fictions of the state, um, which means that uh, compared to, say, the United States, out of where most of the smart city literature is coming, um, uh, don't have a heck of a lot of control over what goes on within the jurisdictional boundaries. And that's really important. One, because um, that means a smart city literature can't as easily translate to the Canadian context. Um, it also likely explains why there are fewer resources um, for cities to even comprehend what's going on when a large corporation like Google comes in and, and pro proposes all this flashy stuff. Um, so um, that means that mus municipalities don't even know what they're getting. And I sort of have to live in, in this dream in this, uh, this PR. Uh, the um, it should be noted that there was talk in the book about outsourcing smart cities to sidewalk. Uh, that's actually existed long before sidewalk labs and is a persistent problem in Canadian cities um, and the federal government as well. How much we don't in-house necessary domain expertise or technical expertise. Um, <clears throat> I did a uh, um, a topic model, a machine learning model of all the smart city challenge grants um, to the, um, um, the last granting program that ended in what, 2018, 2019. And um, it was amazing among other things to note, oh, you could just sort of see the role of the consultant class in writing these applications and the number of phrases that appeared over and over again. I also should note um, to sort of uh, follow on Beth, it's, it's actually quite, we should ask what is a smart city because oftentimes, and we saw this in the topic model, is it's either a rebranding of stuff you've already got, like a bike lane, hey, it's a smart city, it, or it's, um, it's a bundle of projects. So it's I think one of the things that bowled over administration of administrative officials in Canada was how this was so tightly packaged as a singularity of smartness, where um, traditionally in smart cities in Canada and around the world, it's just you get a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B and voila, you have a smart city. Um, uh, to add to this uh, notion of the 
um, the lack of resources in Canada, there is very little paid computational in-house exper expertise in Canada to handle changes in data governance, the introduction of AI and uh, machine learning, ML, <clears throat> um, that um, as much as I'd like to say nice things about the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, their idea of a digital infrastructure is broadband. Broadband is incredibly important in Canada, continues to be an incredibly important Canada, but our professional associations aren't even adequately addressing the sheer impact of not only corporate intrusion on our municipalities, but also um, the impacts of those. Uh, <clears throat> It, it's also, I think, a reflection. One of the things that came out of our initial ideas about um, smart cities in Montreal was the assertion that we were actually a slow city. And slow cities are good in Canada because that means we're a reflective city. We're not a reactive city. Um, and I think that can cause a bit of a panic at the federal government level or at the provincial level. It's like, oh my God, we're getting farther and farther behind. So let's take this blind leap of faith, whether that's in a smart city or um, it's uh, an AI. <clears throat> um, let me know how I'm doing on time. Uh, my second point is the book needs to do a better job of reconciling tech as the destroyer of worlds as tech as essential to democracy. I don't think this is an easy thing to resolve, but it uh, the book did demonstrate that smartness exerts a far greater impact on cities than just seeing Google as a bunch of hardware sensors, search engines, or Android phones. Um, it represents a destroyer of worlds or maybe public governance with the surveillance state, I'm sure that David will talk more about this, adopting the language of the market in using, you know, for example, using the term stakeholders um, instead of the an older political language of democracy or the city as platform. It um, offers a technological solutionism, which is technological determinism as in technology leads to this fabulous thing in the city with um, very complex societal problems that can only be solved by technology. And um, my research expertise is in the coupling of public participation and technology. And um, I fall prey to that as well in framing messiness of democracy as uh, easily amenable to technology. <clears throat> Uh, so you pair this destroyer of worlds with sometimes an uncynical view that technology is fundamental to democracy. And you saw that in the chapters in, on Guelph and Wellington and Innisfil. I feel great sympathy for these municipalities, but it's really hard to square the it's really horrible with it's solving a problem of, say, um, we can't afford buses because we're relatively remote and we're spatially dispersed. And uh, Uber comes in and says, we fixed it for you. And then to look at the implications and the implications were it's, especially with Innisfil, it suddenly became really, really um, expensive to run this system. So my last point is, um, Canada and public participation. So we have the point that um, sidewalk labs engaged in Potemkin or pretend consultations, uh, which were reduced to or framed as field trips and summer camps. Um, I would argue that pretend consultations rather than reflecting a problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis sidewalk labs actually represents an enormous problem of civic participation in Canada. And it's somewhat, uh, we so see somewhat better um, consultation and participation in Quebec than in the rest of Canada. But civic participation in Canada tends to be reduced to consultations as in venture frustrations now leave uh, stakeholders, we got one of this, and we got one of this, and we got one of this, and lobbyists. 
Um, and what that often uh, does is it reduces the messiness and the glory of a democratic participation to representation without power. Uh, and um, I noticed throughout the book that there were often there was often reluctance to engage with that connection to raw political power. That is the only way that participation achieves any real meaning at the, and at minimum achieves influence. Uh, so uh, this becomes particularly problematic if we, we have this because people trust the state, right? There's more trust in Canada than there is in the United States, but it becomes highly problematic as people start distrusting the state because the state's bringing in these large corporate actors to um, do things that the public says, hey, we didn't vote for you. What are you doing here? Um, so um, Canada faces, without resolving this connection of participation to power, a profound fatalism that can generate disengagement from political processes. Um, this is too big for the book, but it's something that um, needs to be looked at. So, um, um, Andrew throughout sort of retreats from raw public power. Um, he even backs away from um, Sherry Arnstein, who's written perhaps the most uh, widely known um, ladder of participation and way of categorizing participation in the world, uh, where she connects participation to political power in favor of, quote, the crisper, less nuanced, but still helpful categorization distinguishing authentic participation from pseudo participation. And a lot of the principles that he's drawing from uh, participatory design, actually Sherry Arnstein wouldn't be considered participation at all. Um, so once again, this is typical to architecture and design where representation matters more than having actual influence on the outcome. So I don't know how much time I've probably gone over the time uh, and I'd have more to say about this, but just let me um, contrast the way that Andrew talks about um, good participation in a smart city with the chapter you had uh, from the activist, the interview of the activist, the chapter you had, and I thought the chapter towards the end on um, to, you know, using these mechanical ways or, or fabric ways to defeat facial recognition and the student who developed the counter app for photo radar, I thought, it was, ah, that'd be kind of iffy. I love that chapter and I love the activist chapter. I love the activist chapter because it pointed to um, the connection to uh, um, seeking power, for example, through unions. So maybe one of the strategies going forward for smart cities might be to strengthen unions' roles in the smart city process. And um, I love the, um, the um, example of the photo radar in which a student developed this counter radar app and it was so, one of the reasons it was so fascinating because we, there's so little talk about raw political power, but there were a couple of sentences about how motorists, um, and presumably like conservative motorists who were used to being able to exceed the speed limit had huge influence over the use of photo radar. So we did have an example of raw political powder, power and we did have an example of tech enabled uh, disruption of uh, the content. So that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Sieber. Uh, I can already tell that we've got a great discussion coming up, uh, but right after one, uh, one more commentator, uh, and I will pass it off to Professor Murakami Wood. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, Gawanokwes Takawe, uh, which is uh, a very bad way of saying on my part, Wolf Island or Longyear. Um, and this has been the ancestral hunting grounds and home of um, many different peoples, but including most, most recently, um, Anishinaabe and the um, Haudenosaunee. 
um, and continues to be the site of reconciliation processes between Haudenosaunee and uh, uh, white settler colonial people, which I'm involved in. Right, um, let's continue with this. I, I think it's really interesting that we ended off on that last talk with this, you know, this idea that um, it was the power essentially of, you know, white right wing car owners, which was, you know, which was actually causing serious, you know, the, one of the real examples of political power in this whole thing. Ironically, from a surveillance point of view, speed cameras and radar traps are actually one of the few, few forms of surveillance unequivocally works. And this is exactly why it sparked so much opposition, of course, it's exactly why so people are so annoyed about them. It's because they actually achieve their goal of slowing people down, you know, finding people who are going too fast and actually making people safer. Um, and it's, it's ironic that when you have forms of surveillance that work and make people safer, that you do get the most opposition to those things and these things are most disrupted by others. Anyway, we'll leave that aside for a second. We may come back to it. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talking about this book. This book is a really necessary intervention in what's going on in Canada, not least because I think from the point of view of many people studying smart, studying smart cities in a global sense, Canada doesn't really or didn't really feature on the radar at all until sidewalk labs occurred. And this in some ways was unfortunate because there was a lot going on in Canada already. Um, and I remember when all the applications came in for the, the government's you know, competition on smart cities and just seeing the diversity of applications there, but also then going through them and being struck by the fact that how many of these applications were essentially just as um, I think Beth earlier on said, um, just, were just basically you know, using or adapting what was already there and claiming, sticking the label smart on top of it. Saying this is like, you know, and some of them were actually Gratuitous, gratuitously and offensively awful. What I mean by this is I saw one application and I'm not gonna say which city it was because I think they'll be unfair at this stage, um, which was proposing to do a program um, to prevent, um, prevent hunger and to solve the hunger problem amongst uh, excluded marginalized people in the city and was gonna do it through essentially a surveillance system involving ID cards and automated you know, sign-ins. And it was just like, this is really what you want to do in order to solve this problem. You're going to go through all of this, create all of this infrastructure, you know, buy into all of this internationalized, um, you know, systems that connect into corporations all around the world. When, you know, you could just give people food <laughs> and you could actually just like give people jobs. You could give people houses. And funnily enough, you know, where people have followed these kinds of programs, you know, um, I'm thinking now of Finland where uh, I'm not going to say they've ended homelessness. Here. It's not true, but, there has been a concerted effort essentially to house people who are homeless, essentially to give them housing. And guess what? It works, right? It works. You don't need to have a complicated infrastructure of technology with automated systems with all these kind of things. You know, you use basic human dignity and you connect with people and you work on what they actually need. In other words, you bring the power of the state to bear on the problems that actually exist and you solve them using the tools that are already there. That's not to say that smart systems are, are useless at all. It's not to say that at all. But in many cases, what we're dealing with here are problems, as um, Renee said, in search of a solution, essentially. You know, we're, we're looking here at sorry, solutions in search of a problem with a smart city technology, um, instead of problems in search of a solution. And this is what uh, Jenny Morozov said a number of years ago about the whole way that Silicon Valley works. You know, its philosophy is to find problems for its solutions. So how does Canada look then? So I'm gonna stay in this area of how has Canada looked from a global you know, point of view in terms of the smart city environment. I work mainly internationally. I got involved in the sidewalk labs thing, you know, largely by accident and, and you know, largely because I was more interested in fact in what Google was doing in smart technologies and then it landed in Toronto. Um, but so what I'm looking at most of the time and what I'm working on right now, for example, are these schemes for utopian new cities that are being put in place around the world. They make cyborg labs look like, you know, a tiny little, um, tiny little thing, not even a neighborhood or nothing. Um, if you look at something like, for example, Neom, which is being built now or being constructed, at least in the early stages in Saudi Arabia, where they're proposing to have, and I quote here, more robots than people, um, an artificial moon that will shine day and night. Uh, all of these kind of, it, it's, it's like some kind of, somebody's watched some Hollywood films um, on the future and just mashed them all together and th thrown it through a machine and come out at the other end of some bizarre version of what they think the future will be look like, will look like for all of us. 
Um, and Neon is not the only one like this. It's, it's, uh, it's graphics are crazy, it's proposal is crazy, it's prospectus is, is, is crazy. Um, and it's now connected to what they're calling the line. It's a 150 kilometer long linear city that will connect Neon to elsewhere in Saudi Arabia. It's also being built, by the way, at the borders of Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, and will eventually be in all four of those countries, apparently. So not only is this a kind of utopian, a strange utopian dream, but it's also a potential geopolitical nightmare. It's a potential spark to all kinds of conflicts. And I think what this speaks to very briefly here is a kind of arrogance that exists amongst the developing, the people and the organizations and the companies developing these systems. In, in almost all of these grand schemes, there's an arrogance. It isn't just about missing participation at the basic level. It's not even taking into account that people exist or care or that they should be interested in people in any way. It's about creating showcase, showcases for technology, which will generate more, techno more technology, more sales and further on like that. This is essentially a kind of advertising strategy. It's a marketplace. Um, and even if it fails, and this is one of the, thing, the points I tried to make in the chapter I wrote for this book. Um, even if it fails, somehow it always succeeds. And I think what, what's interesting here, and this is actually something that Clive Norris, a really excellent surveillance studies researcher, noted a few years ago, um, is that, you know, in, in considering CCTV, closed circuit television or video surveillance has never worked in the way that it, we, we were told it would work, right? At the beginning, and some of you, sorry, most of you are here, apart from myself, and I'm not gonna mention any other names, uh, are probably too young to remember when, when closed circuit television started to be introduced in the early 90s in Britain. Um, and later in Canada, but the arguments were there that, that it would prevent crime, but like this would prevent crime from occurring. It has never prevented crime. And then the arguments moved on to other things, that it would reduce crime or it would help solve crimes. And in those cases, every time this was proven not to be true, somehow instead of removing video surveillance, more surveillance cameras got put in and more highly technolog technologized versions got put in. And we see this again with smart cities too, that when people reject this, or when, when systems don't work, or when, as um, uh, Gemma galdron Clavel showed with the first smart city plan for Barcelona, when it was literally left to fall into ruins, it did not mean the end of the smart city in that area at all, or the end of the ideas that, put, that, that led to those failures. On the contrary, the failures themselves were seen as an opportunity for more innovation. In a sense, this is because this is not part of a, pro a process of civic development, it's part of a process, a political economic process of entrepreneurialism and continual churn of innovation. Okay, and this is how these, these companies see it. And things will basically be as successful as they will, that's part of it, but it's really in the end about this continuous churn. So in this case, the Cyborg Labs um, situation in Toronto is, is a really good example of this, where you see basically uh, um, an organization itself, which has been set up broadly as a favor between friends, um, between friends in the elite of, of sort of the computing industry and the, and the urban development industry here. Um, it's, set, it's set up partly at least as a job creation scheme for ex Bloomberg employees. I said this in the chapter. It's, it's uh, you know, and almost, if you look at lots of the people at the top of this organization, they all worked for Bloomberg previously and in his mayor, when he was mayor of New York. That's not necessarily a terrible thing, but I think most of you who are involved with the consultations here and anybody else who went along to any of them will know the style of consultation that resulted from this kind of unique sort of New York form of politics. It's a lot, it's not very Canadian. I will call it brusque if I'm, if I'm being polite. You could call it a lot worse things if you, if you wanted to, but it really didn't go down very well, I think, with some of the more, you know, Can Canadians like to be asked politely, right? We, we like to be asked nicely. We don't like to be told what's good for us or told what's happening. And that's really what was going on with this situation. Um, I don't know how much more time I've got, but um, how much I'm going to say on this, but um, I'll get a signal on this, I'm sure, in a second. One minute. Oh, there you go. So I think what's interesting now is where we go in Canada. Canada, let's face it, is not a big market um, for uh, you know, global smart city developers, at least not yet. We have basically three cities that are worth those companies actually putting any time or effort into, and that's Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Um, with Toronto, I don't think any of these companies will touch Toronto again with a barge pole now. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing for Toronto. It may be an extremely good thing, um, but it means that Montreal and Vancouver are gonna be now subject to incredible pressure from some of these companies 
to buy to buy solutions to take something new on and so on. There'll be lots of approaches. I think that's something to watch out for. And maybe some of these companies will go for some of the second division cities in Canada as well. But they're not in terms of our global cities. That's really you know where we're looking at. Okay, so that I'll finish there, and we'll have more hopefully in the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, and before we move into this sort of broad discussion, which is already very promising, uh, we'll give uh, Professors Valverde and Flynn an opportunity to respond to, to some of the comments so far. Um, okay, if I can uh, say something. I, I, I want to go back to something that Beth said uh, that really intrigued me. I live in downtown Toronto and I've certainly seen the King Street pilot project and so on, but I never realized, and you would think I would know, I never realized that it had this sort of data mining component or, so we need to know more about that. And in relation to that, I think it's interesting that so much of the critique of internet of things, you know, technologies or artificial intelligence, whatever, has made it seem as though only private for-profit corporations are, um, you know, susceptible to critique. And so the fact that, for instance, in Canada, political parties are exempt from the weak privacy laws that we have. So political parties can collect any data about us, which they do, and they're exempt. That's interesting. And in, in relation to what Beth said about the city of Toronto and King Street, I just want to mention to everybody here that yesterday, by complete accident, I found out that the city of Toronto is doing two things. One of them is that they're about to sign a contract with a company called Pay It, which promises to unify and digitalize payments for uh, property tax and utilities and garbage and so on. Uh, right now, as a homeowner in Toronto, I know these, these are individual bills and they come in the mail with paper. And so I'm sure it's uh, more efficient to digitalize it and unify it. But I never heard of this company pay it. And I have no idea whether a local you know, company couldn't do a better job of that and cost less money. Um, and we don't know about that because the whole conversation has really been about the evil corporations of Silicon Valley, which are certainly evil. But um, as David mentioned, maybe they're not going to touch Toronto with a barge pole for a while anyway. Um, and so I really would like us to think about whether, you know, we can also talk about what cities themselves are doing or what federal political parties are doing, gathering all our data because a federal election is coming up. Like, what about public, like publicly controlled? I mean, even though with the city of Toronto, they're obviously contracting things out because they don't have enough, um, I, either they don't have enough you know, capacity or they don't have enough confidence that the public sector can actually uh, you know, do things themselves. So the question of you know whether we want to separate out a little bit um, the Silicon Valley evil corporate giants from some of the questions that other people have raised about uh, data collection, um, I I I I think that's really important. Of course, with the sidewalk labs, it was easy to go after Google, so we didn't have to worry, and the city wasn't even involved anyway. So. Um, but in the future, I think we need to talk about these things. Yeah, I'll just make a few points. So, um, so first of all, I'd like to thank all the commentators for their really excellent observations about the book, including critiques of the book, which bring it on. I almost feel like we need to craft, you know, volume two, just based on this conversation. Um, but I just wanted to add a couple of points uh, that were that that are uh, kind of reflections um, based on what was said earlier. So number one, Mariana and I really push back against the idea that the city is a victim when it comes to to smart city and technology or the choices that it made. And this is just building on also what what Mariana just mentioned about the role that cities themselves play in 
entering into uh, agreements with other parties or um, not engaging in more thorough discussions with members of the public, we really push back against the idea that the constitutional structure of Canada somehow means that cities are powerless. And in fact, the Sidewalk Labs example is a, is a perfect test case for how the city itself um, really withdrew from decision-making that it could have made, it could have created a framework, a smart city framework as many other cities, including the one that Renee is in have done um, in order to identify what are the policy uh, priorities that the city has and what are the best tools and techniques in order to solve them. So I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, constitution aside and, you know, Mariana and I will probably, you know, have a whole other book on the constitution and cities and all of that stuff. But, you know, that aside, um, the city is not powerless when it comes to protecting the interests of the public. The, um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was in relation to engagement and participation, which is, you know, I feel like we could all just get into the sandbox and, and play with this topic alone if we wanted to. Um, and it's, I just wanted to start by saying it's, it's interesting how we, you know, most of us gave land acknowledgements, but there hasn't yet been much discussion about First Nations and Indigenous people and the extent to which, especially in the Sidewalk Labs example, First Nations were really not included as priorities um, from an engagement and participation perspective, even though this is the land of, um, you know, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations and many other First Nations who have claims to that space. Um, but of course, engagement and participation is possible to do in a meaningful way, both horizontal, horizontally and vertically. And it's, you know, again, the choice of state actors to decide how much do they want to release all of the information that's available on particular projects so that the public can really meaningfully engage with an issue. I mean, Mariana had to go digging for the information that she just told us today. And unless you happen to know the right person at City Hall to contact, it's really difficult to know who uh, P3 partners are or what the terms are of agreements, even you know, accessing information through FOIs, as I'm sure most of us on this panel can attest to, is really difficult. So I think here again, you know, and, and maybe my final point will just be, what is the role of the law in securing uh, protections for people? Um, these are not insurmountable issues. These are policy choices as David has so capably pointed out. These are what are priorities. Um, and we really need to push back against our city actors who are not really permitting us to have the information that we need to make informed decisions.